All right, guys, good morning. Welcome to team. If you're in the lobby, go ahead and finish up getting your stuff. Come on in and find your table. We'll get started with a few announcements. This is week three out of uh, what will be 25 weeks. You can see on your schedule at the front of the, your booklet that we really only have two Fridays off, one um, at Thanksgiving time and one at Christmas time. And other than that, we're going right straight through till the end of March. So week three out of 25. Registrations are continuing. We have guys still finding their way in, remembering to come or maybe uh, not having to travel. So you register at the desk out in the lobby. You can pay your 50 bucks there, cash, check. You can go online. John has it online or, on the, or, or you can go to our website and sign online there too. But uh, that's whenever you get around to it. It's on the honor system. Do remember to sign, uh, to check your name on your table sheet every week. We need that for the first, uh, well, we'll do it for as long as we think it's important to catch, capture guys' uh, emails. And when you find your name on your table sheet, make sure the email's correct. You should be getting an email from me uh, every Monday or Tuesday. If you're not getting an email, it means we either don't have your email correct or it's going to spam. Um, so make sure your email's correct. If your name is not on that table sheet, write it down, give us your email, and we'll just continue going on until we capture everybody. We have 200, 250 guys or so registered. They're here, in and out, but that's how we do that. Um, prayer note, you know, we do this prayer note every year, and we make it available. If we pray for somebody, that you've, uh, when you send a prayer request to me and we pray in front of the whole group, you can pick up one of these here at the front write in the person's name and give it to them in person or send it to them. It's got all signatures. We filled one whole sheet last week and I started another sheet at uh, Lee Norris's table right there, table 22. Who's the next table that needs to get that it did not get to sign last week? Over here? Okay, so take it here and just keep, when you're finished with it, walk it down to the next table It didn't sign it. We'll see if we can finish it out today and I'll find some way to put all those together and we can start sending those out to encourage people. All right, one more reminder. Um, we started the first week, I talked about the team covenant. It's really important to create a sense of uh, safety and confidentiality around your table groups. And that, uh, I want to just remind you, extends to stuff like social media, Twitter, email and stuff. Be careful not to put personal stuff uh, into emails and stuff. That stuff stays out there forever and can get passed along or whatever. Let's just be careful with guys' information and their prayer requests and stuff like that. Let's, let's take care of each other in that way. All right, here's our story for today. This actually came from a team guy this week, and I won't tell you who's. I'll wait till you, uh, until you think it's good or not. <laughs> a young executive named Thompson was leaving the office late one evening when he found the CEO standing in front of a shredder with a piece of paper in his hand. Thompson, I'm glad you're here, said the CEO. I've got this very sensitive, important document, and my secretary's gone for the night. Can you make this thing work? Certainly, sir, said the young executive. He turned the machine on, inserted the paper, and pressed the start button. As the shredder sucked the document in, the CEO slapped Thompson on the back and says, excellent, excellent, I only need one copy. <laughs> I, I won't tell you who said that to me, that was a... Well, last week we looked at the question. We're looking at questions every man must ask. And if you notice, we're going to sort of slowly build a biblical theology in your minds. Uh, it's important to be able to think. What we believe impacts how we live. And some of us, um, even though we've grown up in or around the church, we have sort of a, a little bit of a, a, of a fuzzy um, uh, thought process when it comes to theology. It can be a little bit intimidating. So we are slowly going to build a biblical worldview and going to do it through these questions that every man must ask. So last week we asked the question, uh, where did everything come from? Uh, the question of origins. Uh, where did I come from? And today, we're going to ask the question, why am I here? That's the question of purpose. We, last week, we said everything, including you and including me, came from God. God created all things, and everything belongs to God, so nothing in life makes sense without God. Today, the question is the question of purpose. Why am I here? I'm going to show you a movie clip that gets toward that um, question, uh, how many, does anybody know how many Dirty Harry movies there are with Clint Eastwood playing Harry Callahan? How many Dirty Harry movies? Seven. Somebody says seven. Another guess. Four. Four. The answer is five. There are five Dirty Harry movies. Dirty Harry, Magnum Force, The Enforcer, Sudden Impact, and The Deadpool, made between 1971 and 1988. This clip I'm going to show you is from the second Dirty Harry movie, Magnum Force, made in 1973, and it's really one of my favorite clips so let's watch. 
Oops, yep, there we go. Just hold it right there, Callahan. No tricks. Organizations through, Briggs. There's a lot more where they came from, believe me. Move out of the way. Move it! Uphold the law. You just killed three police officers, Harry. And the only reason I'm not gonna kill you is because I'm gonna prosecute you with your own system. It'll be my word against yours. And who's gonna believe you? You're a killer, Harry. A maniac. Man's got to know his limitations. There it is, right there. You know, I've tried to get my boys, who are all in their 20s now, to watch Clint Eastwood movies with me. And they just think they're too slow, you know, there's not, but you gotta wait for that. You gotta, that's, that's the whole movie is worth it for that line. I just can't convince them. Anyway, a man's got to know his limitations. That's uh, what Hollywood sometimes gets it right, sometimes gets it wrong, but that's actually really good theology right out of the Bible. And we'll see, we'll see why. Today we're talking about why am I here, the question of purpose. Genesis chapter 2 says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And we're going to stop right there. I'm going to take this big chunk, this section of Scripture in sections today. So draw a line right there. We're stopping there. First thing uh, the Bible says about why we are here is that we were put here to work. We were created to work. Now, I graduated from college in 1978. I always say that 70s were an embarrassing time to sort of come of age. Glad there were no digital cameras back then. But graduated from college in 78, spent almost a year living in uh, Europe in Geneva, Switzerland, playing and coaching basketball for a small club team there. And during that time away, I experienced what I believed to be at that time the call of God into ministry. So I came back to the U.S., and went back to school, eventually seminary. But when I came back to the U.S., it was in May. Classes didn't start until late August or early September. So I spent the whole summer working with my brother at a construction company uh, in, in, in that, uh, from, uh, that was owned by a guy or, uh, that, lived, that worked in our church, or that went to our church. So we started every day that summer at 6 a.m. at the warehouse by 6, and we were up at like 4.30, 4.45, kind of like team. Uh, and we spent the mornings loading trucks, uh, driving to job sites, unloading all the material, uh, everything from boxes of floor tile to uh, four by eight foot sheets of drywall. One of our jobs actually was at a Bell uh, telephone center in Orlando where we had to del deliver the drywall, the drywalls delivered via trucks, and we had to hand carry four by eight by three quarter inch drywall up five flights of stairs 
and put deposit on the top of the building. That was hard work. Back, I couldn't even come close to doing it now. And it was 95 degrees, no air conditioning, all that sort of stuff. We worked with three or four other guys every day. Their names were Julius, Willie, and, we, and Big Bob. And they were all from a rougher part of Orlando, and none of them were college students. So one day we're working with Willie. I think we were at the dump site where we take all the garbage at the end of the day. And it was nasty, big old crows, and it smelled. And we, we ended almost every day at the dump, dumping stuff off this big city dump. And all of a sudden, Willie got this big old smile on his face, and he went, look at you college boys, doing the same crap, only he didn't say crap, as me. Look at you college boys, doing the same crap as me. Now, I didn't have the heart or the courage to tell Willie at that point that I wasn't going to be doing that crap very long, right? But at a deeper level, uh, Willie was absolutely right. Because we all are created to work. And it doesn't matter what that work is. We were created to work. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Sometimes I think we think and assume that work is a kind of necessary evil. Kind of like that old country song, you know, take this job and shove it. I ain't working here no more. Bonus question, who sang that song? Johnny Paycheck. Paycheck. That can't be his real name, but it's just an awesome name, so... Johnny Paycheck. But notice that work was part of God's original design for creation. Work only became toil, that is, a painful struggle after the fall of humanity into sin. We'll cover that some next week. Part of his original design. Work was part of how God designed us. Now, we've talked about this many times throughout the history of team. A few years ago, we took a whole team season and dedicated it to a man and his work. But work is part of what's meant by being created in the image of God. We covered that last week. That is, God created us to use our physical strength, our intelligence, our creativity, that are his image stamped on us to share in his work of ordering and caring for the earth. It means that when we work, whether you're a farmer, which is kind of the original job, Adam was to uh, work and tend the garden, A farmer, an engineer, a teacher, a salesman, whether you're inventing, manufacturing, uh, transporting or selling widgets or jet airplanes or microchips, whatever you're doing, when you make that morning commute or deal with a lousy boss or work at a job that seems to have nothing at all to do with God's and his purpose in the world, it actually does. You are honoring God by fulfilling his purpose, one of his purposes, for creating you. Your work matters. In fact, God values what you do as much as he values what I do. I mean, sometimes we have this sort of separation between secular work and sort of sacred work. But the Bible doesn't make that distinction. All work is equally valuable because God created us to work. So even though your work may be hard or frustrating, uh, it's far more than just a way to earn money. And by the way, that's why it's so painful for us, for a man in particular, when we lose a job or lose work or are out of work or are looking for work because we were created to work. By the way, if you're between jobs now and you're in a frustrating season of looking, uh, don't be afraid to let me know through email, to give me a little of your background because every now and then we make a connection through team, through somebody I know. Not always, but every now and then we can make a connection and help you in that process. So we're created to work. Secondly, we're also created to obey. We're created to obey. Years ago, when our uh, boys were all still young, maybe the oldest was about 14, the youngest about seven, uh, my wife had to go away for a long weekend. I think it was a college friends reunion or something. And she was hardly ever away at that time. She really ran the household like many of our wives do. But she was away for a whole weekend. And we were at that stage of life where where routines were really important because we had young kids. Mealtime routines, bedtime routines. My wife left behind a detailed meal plan you know, for the, for the sustenance of our young children. You know, spaghetti on Friday, uh, instructions for how to make the, uh, the grilled chicken on Saturday, and a pot roast in the crock pot for Sunday. And then she left. And I took a few liberties with the plan. You know, Portillo's for dinner <laughs> Friday night while we watch the Cubs game. Pizza Saturday, find a way to get rid of the boxes, you know, so they're not laying around the house or in, even in the garbage. You, know, you can't even put them in the garbage because you're going to see the garbage. So you got to kind of get rid of those boxes, right? Uh, bedtime got tweaked just a little bit. Got to watch the end of the game, you know. Chocolate donuts for breakfast and chocolate milk. I mean, chocolate milk's like a great recovery drink now, right? I was right even back then. 
So she's away like three days. She gets home, and on Sunday, or Sunday it was Sunday night or Monday night, the, almost the very first mealtime we're all together again, my youngest son, Canaan, who is now uh, 20, he was about seven at the time. At the very first mealtime, he pipes up out of nowhere, completely unprompted, and says, hey, Mom, you know what? When you're gone, all the rules change. <laughs> and I was like, no, no. That was not good, let me tell you, not good. But it was true, because I kind of like to make my own rules. I kind of like to make my own rules. The Bible says that God makes the rules, and the way it says that is that he's created us with limits. Clint was right. A man's got to know his limitations. Verse 16, and the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil when you eat it from it, for when you eat up from it, you will certainly die. Okay, so God created the universe from nothing, covered that last week. He then created Adam and Eve, humanity, male and female, in his own image, put them in the garden with everything they needed for life and relationship with him and with each other. Everything they needed. You can eat from anything in the garden. And then right in the middle of their existence, he placed a limitation, a boundary. But that tree, you must not eat, eat from that tree. Why does he do that? Right here in the second chapter of the first book of the entire Bible. Well, think about parenting for a minute. Those of you who have had the um, experience of being a parent. As parents, we love our children. And we want to give them everything they need, Right? <clears throat> but we also set boundaries and limits for them. Don't play in the street. Uh, don't play with matches. Don't grow up to be a Packer fan. You know, all those kinds of things. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> don't eat cookies before dinner time. Now, why do we do that? Two reasons. One is we know better than them because they're just children. Secondly is because we love them, right? We know better and we love them. What kind of parent says, oh, you want to play in the street? Have at it. Knock yourself out. What parent says, oh, you want to eat cookies and ice cream before mealtime? Whatever makes you happy, honey. Now, if you grew up like that with parents like that, you know the price you pay because you know you're not loved if there's no boundary set for you. Of course we don't do that. Limits are good. Limits are an expression of our love. Well, God has created human beings with limits. When he says you can eat from any tree in the garden except that one, he's saying, I am God, you are not. I know better than you. And I love you, and I love you way too much to let you live without limits. Because if you live without limits, you will what? You will die, spiritually and physically. God's limits expression of his love. But here's the truth. We don't like limits very much. It's just human nature. We don't like limits very much. For example, our whole culture rebels against limits. We don't like speed limits all that much. How about those automatic cameras that catch you at stop signs? You like those? I hate those things, right? We don't like being told when we can and can't use our cell phones. We don't like limits on our freedom. For example, one of the more um, subtly dangerous things that our culture teaches our children and that we teach our children is you can be anything you want to be. Now that sounds good, and it's well-intentioned. It's just not true. For example, I always wanted to be 6'5". I did. And I wanted to have a vertical jump of 40 inches. I wanted to play basketball. But I wasn't 6'5". And I couldn't do that. And no matter how much I tried and lifted and lifted and lifted, I couldn't jump 40 inches. I had limitations. I was born with physical limitations. So were you. And sometimes we don't like that. We don't like being told that we have limits. We rebel against the limits of God. For example, we don't like God's definition of marriage and sexuality as a culture. We'll talk about that in a few moments. We don't even like his definition of gender. We could talk about that as well. But Harry Callahan was right. A man's got to know his limitations because God's limits are good and we're only free when we're willing to live within the limits he's created for us. More on that next week. So secondly, we're created 
to obey, to, uh, to live within the limits of God. And thirdly, we're created for relationship. For relationship. One night during my junior year in college, would have been uh, spring of 1977, my roommate and I are in bed. He was down in his bed. I'm up in a loft. And it's, it's like, I don't know, two in the morning when you have these college conversations, right? It's like two in the morning. And suddenly, they're in the darkness. My roommate, Mike, pipes up and says, suddenly, out of nowhere, he says, you know what, Roro? <coughs> that was my nickname in college because my middle name is Roland. They found out about it, and there you go. You know what, Roro? God really messed up. I was surprised because I'd never heard Mike talk about God before, not even once. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, God really messed up when he made two sexes. And I got very nervous. <laughs> I thought I knew Mike, you know. <laughs> I, what, what, do you, what do you mean? And he said, as guys, <clears throat> we get along great, right? You know, we're buds, we hang out, we have fun, we're cool. And everyone knows <coughs> excuse me, that girls never get along. They're always fighting about something. They're mad about this. They're crying. Way too much drama. And whenever guys and girls get together, that's just pain. He's just gone through a breakup. So God messed up, he says. He said he should have just made one sex, guys. And if we needed to multiply, he could have had us just like butt off on a smaller guy. I mean, he's God, right? That's what Mike said. Middle of the night, two in the morning. That's the kind of conversation you have. Well, God's design, verse 18, we see. The Lord God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. Now, if we back up just for a moment, when God created Adam and Eve, he said, let us make man in our image. If you were paying attention last week and read this on your own, you might have gone, huh, that's interesting. Who's the us he's talking about? Who's us there? Who's the other people with God? What's up, what's up with that? Well, the Bible teaches that God exists eternally as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That the Trinity, as we call it in Christian theology, was preexistent. Uh, there was no beginning to it. But God has always existed in relationship with himself. And that's kind of a mind-boggling concept. That's who the us is. The us is the three persons of the Trinity. So if we're created in God's image, we're also created, created for and with the capacity for relationships. And the innate need for relationships is expressed most fully in God's design for human sexuality. Now, verse 19. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. This is kind of the beginning of science, I think, and animal husbandry. Look at the animals and see what they're like and name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam... No suitable helper or no partner for the journey of life <coughs> was found. <coughs> so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs, then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Verse 24. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Naked and no shame. Now, some of you might be a little surprised to find that sentence in the Bible. Oh, nakedness was God's idea. That's true. Nakedness was God's idea. And notice, there was no shame attached to nakedness. You probably noticed along with me that Hugh Hefner died last week, founder of Playboy Enterprises. And I saw all kinds of tributes, you know, an American icon, a pioneer, so forth and so on. Let me just say this. Hugh Hefner did as much to desecrate and even destroy the image of God in us as men and in women as almost anyone who ever lived. Okay? Hugh Hefner turned sex from that which God created as good, holy, and free from shame to that which can be bought and sold filled with shame. He took the wonderfully personal and intimate thing God created into something and made it into something anonymous and shallow and shameful. 
He told us as men that we are nothing more than leering animals and women are nothing more than targets for our lusts. Far, far from the image of God. Notice, Adam and Eve were naked and felt no shame. Why? Why was there no shame? Notice the order of their relationship. Man leaves his father and mother. That grows to maturity and independence. Is united to his wife. That's the covenant of marriage. The Bible teaches one man and one woman united in a covenant relationship for life. That's just a biblical definition. Third, then they become one flesh. That's physical intimacy. That's why there's no shame. It happens in... It, one fleshness takes place within the covenant that's protected by God's intimacy and design. That's how we're designed. That's how marriage works. That's how human sexuality works. No reducing a person. Marriage, God's design does not reduce a person to the summation of their body parts. It's we are built for relationships. So, back to the question of purpose. Why are you here? Why am I here? The Bible starts with three purposes. First, to work. God has given us a work to do. Whether or not you're, we're paid for it, we have a work to do that participates in his kingdom. Secondly, we're here to obey God, that is to live in a right relationship with him. That will include eventually understanding what the gospel is. We'll talk about that in a few weeks. But it means we find our freedom within the limits he's established for us. And thirdly, we are created for relationships. We're here for relationships. Now, we don't have to be married to have those significant relationships with other people, other men, other friends. But when we are married, we are designed for an intimate covenant relationship with one person. That's how God designed it. So, questions I want you to deal with around the table, and I think you have enough time, but there's three of them this week, so you have to kind of move. First, have you ever thought of your current job as being connected to God's design for creation? How so? Secondly, how does the understanding of the limit of God in Genesis help you understand both the love of God and human nature? And third, does the sentence Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame surprise you in any way? So you can jump into any of those questions, take on all of them or take on something else and talk about it. I'll wrap you up in about 20 minutes at 6.52 for our prayer time. So get your coffee, get a donut, and I'll wrap you up at 6.52.